Hello everyone and welcome to another scintillating video for human physiology. Last time we tackled the concept of pH and buffered solutions since we were talking uh, quite a bit beforehand about the importance of water and how water forms the solvent for all of our uh, biologically important solutes that we're going to be talking about through the semester so a uh, discussion on pH and buffers was necessary so now we're going to move on to the next discussion which is going to focus on chemical reactions and the importance of enzymes so let's go ahead and get into this so a chemical reaction is uh, going to take place when something occurs that causes chemical bonds between atoms. Remember, we call those intramolecular forces as opposed to intermolecular forces like what we see with hydrogen bonds. Chemical reaction is what occurs when chemical bonds between atoms are either formed or broken to produce new molecules. So if you take a pot of water and you start boiling it and you vaporize all the water into a, a gas, well, you've broken all of the hydrogen bonds, but a chemical reaction has not taken place. You've only changed the form that water is taking. A chemical reaction is one in which you are actually breaking uh, bonds in between atoms, uh, actual covalent bonds, and you are actually changing the chemical nature of what is present. So one of the first things that we'll need to discuss here is that chemical bonds between atoms store up a kind of energy called potential energy. And as the name implies, potential energy is energy that is stored and then can be put use to later depending on what you do with it. So ultimately, chemical bonds are basically storing energy that can be tapped into later the same way a battery does. Now, we need to look at this in the context of the two different types of metabolic reactions that we discussed in chapter one. So we said that a chemical reaction here uh, is either going to involve the breaking of chemical bonds or the formation of new chemical bonds. So if we are going to form a chemical bond, meaning that we are taking energy and we are packaging it up in a new chemical bond, that obviously is going to mean that energy input is going to be required. And you might remember that we call these anabolic reactions. Anabolic reactions start out with very small and very simple molecules and we combine them together into a much more complex molecule that has chemical bonds that join those more simple substituents together to form the more complex whole. And then on the other hand, if we want to break a pre-existing chemical bond uh, to take a larger molecule and then break it apart into little pieces, energy is going to be released in that regard because when you break a bond, you release the energy from that bond. You'll recall that we call these catabolic reactions. So you should hopefully remember all of this from chapter one. Anabolic reactions require an input of energy to build complex molecules and form bonds. Catabolic reactions break bonds and therefore release energy. Now, something for us to consider is that not every chemical bond is created equal in terms of the amount of potential energy they store. So some bonds just store more energy than others. So this is why, and this is going to become important to us later on in the semester, this is why uh, in certain instances we will consider some molecules to be high energy molecules some examples being sugars and fats and things like that, things that we have to eat and we get our energy out of the food that we eat. And basically what our uh, metabolism does is that we break those molecules down, we break the high energy chemical bonds that hold those food molecules together and we harvest the energy out of it and packages, package it up into ATP. So some molecules are at a high energy state. Those covalent bonds that hold those fat and sugar molecules together have a lot of energy in them, while other molecules are what we might consider to be low energy molecules. So for example, carbon dioxide and water, while they do have chemical bonds holding them together, there's not really a whole lot of energy in those bonds. So our body doesn't really try to waste too much time trying to squeeze energy out of breaking those molecules down. Those molecules are already very, very simple. It's, it's going to be really hard to break them apart and get any more energy out of those bonds. 
So while we're on the subject, let's talk about this chemical reaction right here, one that we're going to become familiar with a lot throughout the semester. So this is the basic bare bones uh, chemical equation for cellular respiration. So cellular respiration is the uh, principal way by which our cells make ATP. And we'll talk about this more in chapter three regarding the oxygen requirement, how much ATP do you make and things like that. So cellular respiration, here's the bare bones chemical formula here. Uh, C6H12O6 plus six uh, molecules of oxygen uh, yields six molecules of carbon dioxide plus six molecules of water plus a whole lot of energy, right? So it's that energy that we harvest and we package up into ATP, right? So that C6H12O6, you probably know this by now, but that's glucose, right? So glucose, if you actually look at this reaction, the funny thing is that this reaction actually can just take place out in the open air. So one thing that I could do right now, I'm sitting in my office right now at TCC, I could walk out my door, I could go down to the chemical storage closet, I could grab a bottle of glucose, we have that, I could grab a bottle of glucose, I could just empty out the whole thing on the uh, top of my desk, and I've got all this glucose and it is surrounded by the oxygen in the air. So what we would do in that instance is we have both of the reactants that are necessary for cellular, cellular respiration to occur, at least according to this formula here. We have the glucose, it's sitting on my desk. We've got the oxygen, it's in the air that's all around us. But here's the problem. Uh, nothing's gonna happen, right? So you could have told me that. You, you Really, you don't need much scientific education to tell me that, okay, a bunch of sugar on the top of my desk isn't really going to do anything, right? But why is that? Well, we need to look at this from a couple of different angles. So this is actually what we would call a spontaneous reaction, and we'll have a little bit more to say about that later. But what that means is that a spontaneous reaction goes downhill in terms of its energy requirements. Glucose is a higher energy molecule than either carbon dioxide or water. So because the energy diagram takes us downhill from a high energy state to a low energy state, this is what we call a spontaneous reaction. Meaning, if we just get everything together and just leave it alone, eventually the reaction is gonna happen. But, if we do this the way that I've been describing it, just leaving some glucose on the top of my desk, it's gonna take a while. It's going to take many, 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 many years for anything to happen. So just because something is spontaneous, that does not mean it's fast. So we wanna make sure that we don't make that mistake, right? Something can be spontaneous, but that does not mean it's fast. So in this case, this is a spontaneous reaction, but it is very, very laboriously slow. So here's the issue though. Cellular respiration, we already have a pretty good conception. It's important for our cell, cellular biology and our physiology, right? We need to ha have our cells be able to take glucose, combine it with oxygen, and turn it into energy that our cells and our uh, the rest of our body can use. We can't really get away with this reaction being as slow as it apparently is. So the idea here is that the speed of chemical reactions, not just cellular respiration, but all the other metabolic reactions that are happening inside your cells, the speed of those reactions is very important. We need those reactions to be happening really, really, really quickly, right? So we need them to happen quickly so that we can counter these real-time fluctuations in our homeostasis, whether it's the concentration of this solute, the concentration of this metabolite, what's your blood pressure, how much sugar is in the blood. Our cells and our body need to be able to get these chemical reactions going in the right direction very quickly in response to stimuli that pop up just like that. So. What we need to discuss then is how do cells put conditions in their favor to make these reactions as quick as they possibly can be. So let's talk about that. So factors that affect the speed of chemical reactions. The first place to start is going to be temperature. So temperature, I don't really need to tell you what temperature is. Uh, so, so if you increase the temperature in the environment in which a reaction is taking place, you are 
uh, increasing the amount of a certain kind of energy that those molecules have. We call this the energy of movement. This is what is called kinetic energy. So if you increase the temperature, molecules in the system are just naturally going to start moving around a lot faster as the temperature goes up. So if you just keep cranking up the temperature, molecules in the area will start moving around a lot more quickly. And what you do is you start increasing the likelihood that two molecules that participate in a chemical reaction are going to find each other and collide with each other. So a chemical reaction may be very slow if the temperature is very cold, meaning that the molecules aren't moving around very fast, and if that's the case, they're going to have a hard time bumping into each other. But if the temperature gets to be very high, then the molecules are moving around a lot more quickly, and you have a much higher probability that those molecules will collide with one another, and you'll get a chemical reaction. So the idea here is that if we just keep increasing the temperature, the rate of the chemical reaction should just keep going up and up and up and up and up and up, right? Well, here's the issue. In biological systems, obviously talking about the chemical reactions that are happening in our body, in cells, and in nature, uh, there are what we might call diminishing returns if the temperature gets too high. So there is a limit to the benefit that we get out of increasing temperature. If you look at this diagram in which the y-axis tracks the rate or speed of the reaction and the x-axis tracks the temperature in degrees Celsius, you can see that if we start at the freezing point of zero degrees Celsius, increasing the temperature does produce a pretty steady climb and increase in the speed of the reaction. But once we get to a certain point, increasing the temperature any further actually produces uh, diminishing returns and causes the re rate of the reaction to get very, very, very slow. And eventually, if it gets too hot, the reaction will just come to a grinding halt. We'll talk about why this is later. I'm sure, you, pr based on uh, having already taken general biology, most of you, you probably already know why this is, but we will circle back to this and explain why this happens a little bit later on when we talk about proteins and enzymes. The second factor that affects the speed of reactions is the concentration of reactants. We've already established the definition for concentration for any substance in that it refers to the number of particles or just the amount of that substance in a given volume of liquid or solution or container, whatever it may be. Uh, the units for concentration can be given in a number of different ways. The most common ones are going to be moles per liter, that's molarity. Uh, milligrams per liter or milligrams per milliliter, uh, equivalents or milliequivalents per liter. So if you're going to go on to nursing like most of, like I think most of you are, you're going to become a, uh, familiar with a lot of different measures of concentration. So what we want to think about here is that we want to think about chemical reactions in the same way that we did for temperature, right? So for temperature, increasing the temperature increase the likelihood that two molecules are going to collide with one another. Well, it's really the same concept here. So if you think of two reactant molecules colliding like two dance partners meeting up on the dance floor, well, if you're looking for a dance partner, you're going to have a much easier time finding your dance partner if there's a lot of people on the dance floor versus a dance floor that only has a couple of people on it, right? So uh, the more dance partners or the more prospective dance partners there are, the much faster it's going to be that you actually end up dancing with someone. It's the same thing for these reactant molecules. The more concentrated the reactants are, the more uh, molecules we squeeze into a tight space, the more likely it becomes that you're going to get a productive chemical reaction and the reaction will start happening a lot more quickly. And it's worth mentioning that concentration can actually be changed in one of two different ways. You can either do so by changing the number of particles that are present, or you can actually just change the volume of the space those particles occupy, whether you shrink it or expand it. Either way, the concentration is going to change. And then finally, by far the most important booster to the speed of a chemical reaction in biological systems is the presence of a catalyst. So in biology, these catalysts are always going to be what we call enzymes. 
Enzymes are almost always going to be proteins, and we'll talk about proteins towards the end of this chapter, or in very rare cases, in the case of the ribosome, uh, you can have RNA enzymes, which we call ribozymes. So we already mentioned that in the case of something like slapping a bunch of glucose down on my table, that reaction, even though it's spontaneous, it's going to be really, really slow, right? If we just leave it by itself with nothing else, just the glucose and the oxygen mingling together, that reaction is going to be super duper slow. It's going to be too slow to be really important at all. Even if we get the temperature just right, or even if we get the reactant concentrations really high, this reaction is still going to be super duper duper slow, which is why an enzyme is so very important. Enzymes at, and catalysts in general will speed up the rate of a chemical reaction without being used up themselves. That's probably the most common definition of a catalyst. It speeds up the reaction but is not used up itself, so it can just keep cranking through reaction after reaction without any limitation. But in the case of an enzyme, an enzyme does this by reducing the amount of energy required for the reaction to be initiated. Now, this can be a little bit hard to picture if you don't have some sort of visual aid. So we'll actually look at some diagrams of what enzymes kind of look like here in just a minute. But let me give you kind of an analogy here. Uh, you're going to find out throughout the semester, I really like Lego analogies. So imagine that you have a whole bunch of Lego bricks. So just a bunch of Lego bricks. You just throw them all into a plastic container and you start shaking it up. Well, how many of those Lego bricks, let's say a thousand Lego bricks are in this plastic container, you start shaking up the container. Well, do you think all of those Lego bricks, after you shake it up, do you think all those Lego bricks are going to have connected to other Lego bricks? No, probably not, because you know that in order to attach a Lego brick to another Lego brick, you have to position the bricks just right, you have to get the little uh, inserts to fit into the little uh, holes just right, you have to push on it, you have to give it a little bit of energy to get the bricks to stick together. So just getting all the little bricks into a container and shaking it up, that's not going to be sufficient, even though all the conditions are just right for uh, some bricks to stick together, uh, you have to get the bricks aligned just right and you have to get them to fit together. And that is essentially what an enzyme is going to do. An enzyme will take molecules that are capable of reacting together and it's going to orient them together in just the right way to get them to react. You have to get bond angles just right, you have to get the uh, reactants positioned in just the right way to make the uh, proceeding of the chemical reaction actually favorable. So another way of looking at this is that the enzyme is just going to force the two reactants to collide in the correct way rather than just leaving it up to random chance. So if you put a whole bunch of Lego bricks into a box and you shake it up, the chance of bricks actually sticking together, it's going to be astronomically small unless you actually take your hands and your fingers and you actually attach the bricks together. In this case, your hands would actually be the enzyme, of course. Okay, so I gave you my Lego brick analogy. This is more of what enzymes actually kind of look like. We'll talk about uh, enzymes a little bit more towards the end of this chapter when we have a better conceptualization of protein structure and function. But in an enzyme-catalyzed reaction, the reactants have a special name. We call these substrates. So uh, any molecule can be a substrate for an enzyme. That doesn't change what the molecule is. So if a reactant can be acted upon by an enzyme, we call that reactant a substrate. So what's going to happen here is that substrates will fit into a binding pocket within the enzyme called an active site. We'll have more to say about that later. You might notice that this substrate here actually has a shape that fits pretty well into that active site so that this substrate can fit in here, but other potential substrates cannot. So once the substrate fits into the active site, the enzyme is going to orient that molecule in just the right way so that we can either break or form chemical bonds. In the case of this reaction, you can see we are breaking chemical bonds because we take one substrate molecule and form two products. So we must have broken a chemical bond that joins the kind of circle to the diamond right here. So like I said, Enzymes are going to speed up reactions by 
activating the substrate so that it becomes much, much, much easier for that, rea uh, for that substrate to turn into whatever the product is supposed to be. So the amount of energy it takes in order to get the substrates activated so that the reaction can proceed is called the activation energy. So these diagrams that you're looking at here will actually track not only the progression of the reaction over time, that's on the x-axis, but on the y-axis we're actually tracking the relative amount of energy in both the reactants and the products. So in this case you'll notice that the reactants in, uh, start with a greater amount of energy than the products. And this is essentially what I was telling you about glucose. Glucose is a high energy molecule and after a round of cellular respiration you produce lower energy molecules like carbon dioxide and water. That's why we call it spontaneous. It starts up here and it ends up down here. Well, the problem and the reason why this reaction is so slow if you don't have an enzyme is because of the presence of this barrier, what we call the activation energy. This is the amount of energy that has to be put into the system in order to activate those substrates so that they can then go, start going downhill and form their products. If you don't have the appropriate amount of energy, the reaction is just going to not do anything and that's why that reaction is so slow because it takes a lot of time to eventually come up with this energy to get the reaction to move forward. So what an enzyme does is based on the actions of the enzyme and orienting the substrates in just the right way, it actually greatly reduces the amount of activation energy required to get the substrate into the right configuration so that it takes much, much, much less time to go from a reactant into a product. So I actually came up with a really good analogy for this. Hopefully you'll agree. So I call this the carnival analogy. So imagine that you want to go to the carnival or the state fair or whatever, right? So uh, let's say that the cost to get in through the front gate is $10. So you got to pay $10 if you want to get into the fair. So this is going to be basically our uh, barrier to our entry. This is our activation energy. If you want to get into the fair, you have to pay $10 in the same way that if you want glucose to turn into carbon dioxide and water, you have to pay a certain amount of activation energy. So let's say that you forgot your wallet or you forgot your purse at home. So you've, you've got no money. You don't have any money in order to pay the admission cost, right? So instead of just going home, let's say that you decide to go out into the parking lot and you're going to go dumpster diving, right? You're going to look on the ground. You're going to look in trash bags or whatever. Gross, right? So you're going to stoop to the lowest levels and you're going to look for loose change on the ground or maybe a dollar here and there. You're going to look for loose change until you come up with exactly $10 to get you into the fair. Well, consider how long it would take to come up with $10 in loose change. Anytime you come across loose change, you're probably finding a penny, or maybe if you're lucky, you find a nickel or a quarter, right? So you're not just going to find a $10 bill on the ground. You're going to have to come up with the energy bit by bit by bit over a long period of time. So with this being the case, having this steep admission cost of $10 starting with zero dollars and zero cents, it's going to take you a long time to eventually get into the fair because you do not have anything helping out with this energy cost. Okay, what about another scenario? What if your best friend is working the ticket booth and they say they can give you a real sweetheart deal on the admission cost? So you don't have to pay $10. Let's say you just have to pay $1 instead. That's quite a discount, right? But you still don't have any money, so you're gonna do the same thing. You're gonna go, go out into the parking lot and you're gonna look for loose change. Well, is it gonna take as long to find $1 in loose change as it did to find $10 in loose change? No, you could actually come up with $1 relatively quickly, right? So the amount of time it takes for you to get into the fair is going to be drastically reduced because the admission cost was drastically reduced as well. And that is exactly what enzymes do. So the enzyme in this analogy, 
as I'm sure you can identify, would be your friend at the ticket booth. They are the ones giving you the discount. They are the ones reducing the energy barrier to your entry, and they are going to be responsible for it taking much less time for you to get into the fair. The same way enzymes reduce the amount of time it takes for a reaction to proceed. Okay, so you're probably thinking at this point that these activation energy barriers seem like kind of an inconvenient thing, right? What a pain in the rear, right? Why do we have to have this? So why is that important? Well, think of it this way. Imagine the stability of all the molecules in your body if we did not have activation energy barriers. So all the proteins and all the carbohydrates and nucleic acids and lipids and all the molecules that make up your body. Well, if we don't have activation energy barriers, those covalent bonds would be very, very easy to break. So uh, guess what? Those Breaking those covalent bonds is that spontaneous, that those covalent bonds in most cases are going to be at a high energy, so breaking those bonds should be fairly spontaneous. Well, having those activation energy barriers seems kind of important now because it will prevent those bonds from being broken unless a specific enzyme is there to speed it up. So what this means is that we can actually pick and choose using our enzymes when is the correct time? When is the correct place to be breaking these bonds? If we do not need to be breaking bonds in a protein or breaking bonds in DNA or RNA, then we're not going to do it. We're not going to have enzymes in place or enzymes activated that are capable of doing that because that's not what we need to be doing right now. So enzymes allow us to choose the time and place and the appropriateness of breaking chemical bonds. We do it when we need to, and we can shut those enzymes off and prevent them from working to preserve the stability of molecules inside the cell. So overall from this discussion, our conclusion can be that most chemical reactions in the body are way too slow to occur by themselves. So that's why we have enzymes. They speed up these reactions and the body can actually regulate those enzymes to make sure that we are catalyzing reactions at the right time and at the right place. As to how we regulate those enzymes, we can talk about, about that a little bit more in chapter three. Okay, so before we wrap up this discussion, let's go back and look at a chemical reaction that we were looking at in the last video. This is uh, the formation of carbonic acid from carbon dioxide and water, and we talked about why this reaction is so important as it pertains to the pH of your blood plasma. For simplicity, I removed the dissociation of carbonic acid into hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions just to keep things nice and simple here. So all you have to pay attention to for right now is just the reaction as you see it here. So now we can come to appreciate that this reaction is catalyzed by an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase. This enzyme is mostly found inside of your red blood cells. So that enzyme is in the right place to make sure that we are regulating the pH of the blood well. So what we want to use this chemical reaction to demonstrate is something called the law of mass action. What I want you to be able to do is predict how a reaction will proceed based on how uh, the concentrations of the reactants and the products are changing. And this is going to be a skill that you will need to develop by the time that we talk about this reaction again, come time when we start talking about respiration. So if you look at this reaction, we've got carbon dioxide, which is produced during cellular respiration. We've got water, which is everywhere, obviously. So if these two reactants are together in the presence of carbonic anhydrase, carbonic anhydrase will convert that into the product of uh, carbonic acid, right? And the double arrows here is meant to signify that the reaction is reversible. So once we formed carbonic acid, we can actually treat that as the substrate and then reform the products, carbon dioxide and water. So this reaction goes both ways. Well, because this reaction goes both ways, uh, this reaction is eventually going to settle at what is called equilibrium, in which case the forward and reverse reactions are happening at exactly the same speed. 
And when a chemical reaction is at equilibrium, you are going to have a predetermined ratio of product to reactant. We can, uh, you might remember this from general chemistry, but we measure this as KEQ. This is the equilibrium constant. This is the ratio of the concentration of carbonic acid divided by the uh, concentrations multiplied together of the two reactants here, carbon dioxide and water. We're not gonna do any of these calculations, but just remember that at equilibrium, this ratio that you see here is going to be a constant, right? So it's not gonna change. So something to appreciate about enzymes is that, is that enzymes do not change this ratio. All enzymes are going to do is speed up the reaction so that we reduce the amount of time it takes for equilibrium to be reached. Enzymes are not capable of changing the equilibrium value. That would be that would require changing the laws of thermodynamics. All enzymes do is speed things up so that equilibrium is reached much faster. So the way I like to think about the law of mass action is it basically describes the momentum of a reaction that is not at equilibrium. So at equilibrium, the forward and the reverse reactions are happening at exactly the same rate. So we form a certain amount of, carb of carbonic acid and we also reform a certain amount of carbon dioxide and water such that they satisfy this ratio. But if the reaction is not at equilibrium, then this ratio does not hold up, but the reaction is going to move in the direction so the equilibrium will be re-established. So let's take a look at this. Uh, so I thought I had a little bit more there, so I guess we'll just stick here. Uh, so consider that we start in a situation in which we've got a bunch of carbon dioxide and water, but no carbonic acid. So the concentration of carbonic acid is zero, and we've got a whole bunch of carbon dioxide and water. Well, what this means is that in order to get to KEQ, in order to get to equilibrium, the reaction needs to go very fast from left to right. We need to really start forming a lot of carbonic acid and using up a lot of carbon dioxide and water. So if this is the case, the reaction will move to the right. So that is the law of mass action in effect. So if, you, if the balance here is shifted in one direction, Law of mass action says the reaction will proceed to re-establish equilibrium. So if we've got a whole bunch of carbon dioxide and water and no carbonic acid, the reaction is going to very quickly swing from the left to the right. We will start to form a lot of carbonic acid and we will take away a lot of the carbon dioxide and water that is present. Okay, so one more demonstration of this. Let's say that we are at equilibrium. So let's say that everything's at equilibrium here. We've got the rate, we've got the concentrations of these three molecules that satisfy this ratio. What if we just suddenly start adding in a whole bunch of carbonic acid? So we take this system that is at equilibrium and then we just start adding a whole bunch of carbonic acid. Well, what that's gonna do is increase greatly the concentration of carbonic acid, and guess what that's gonna do? It's gonna throw the whole system out of equilibrium. These ratios are out of whack, so what the law of mass action says is that the reaction is going to change direction so that we reestablish equilibrium. In this case, the reaction would swing from right to the left. We would start going from the right to the left. We would start reforming more carbon dioxide and water and start using up some of that extra carbonic acid that the system just took on. So that is the law of mass action. The direction of a reversible reaction uh, can change depending on where the system is. If the system's at equilibrium, then nothing much is gonna change, but if you do something to change, equal, change things so that you're not at equilibrium anymore, the system is going to adapt so that equilibrium will be reestablished. Okay, and then the last thing that we wanna talk about in this video, it's been kind of a long video, but we wanna kinda of tie everything together. Some of our earlier videos focused on water. We wanna talk about the idea that water itself can actually participate in chemical reactions. 
So we've already talked a lot about water acting as a solvent for a lot of different biologically important solutes, but water can also willingly participate in chemical reactions, especially those that construct very large macromolecules, which again, that's an example of an anabolic reaction, and then also the reverse reaction, the types of reactions that will break those large macromolecules down, another example of catabolic reactions. So in this case, there are two major types of chemical reactions involving water that you need to be aware of. The first is called dehydration synthesis. That is what you're looking at right here. This is going to involve the liberation of one molecule of water so that we can form a covalent bond between two compatible molecules, what we call monomers. So if you compare these two monomers to one another, you can see they have these little uh, groups out here, and you can actually see an element of water here, HHO, H2O. So if during the course of this enzyme-catalyzed reaction, if we liberate a water molecule, we actually join these two monomers together so that now instead of having two very simple molecules, we have one more complex molecule. So don't forget that as an example of an anabolic reaction. Okay, the opposite reaction, which is just the same thing but going in the opposite direction, this is called a hydrolysis reaction. This involves breaking okay, a covalent bond between two monomers by doing essentially the reverse of what we just did. We take a water molecule, we use that water molecule to break that covalent bond, and we reconstitute the water molecule among these groups on each of the monomers. And that is, of course, a catabolic reaction because you start complex and you end up simple. So the reason why this is going to be important going into the next chapter and a lot of your on your own work for this chapter, uh, the idea here is that we can build very large, very complex biomolecules by doing many rounds of dehydration synthesis. If you have a whole bunch of monomers and you start joining them together by dehydration synthesis, you form what is called a polymer. And what you're going to come to find here is that important uh, macromolecules like proteins and carbohydrates and DNA and RNA, they are actually just polymers that are built by using enzyme-catalyzed dehydration synthesis. But the difference, as you're going to find out, is that each of these polymers is made up of a different kind of monomer. Proteins are made of amino acids, carbohydrates are made of monosaccharides, and nucleic acids are made out of nucleotides. And then similarly, if you have a very large polymeric molecule like a protein or like a carbohydrate, you can use enzyme-catalyzed hydrolysis to break those covalent bonds and reconstitute the individual monomer components. And like I said, although the identity of the monomer will be different for each kind of biomolecule, the concept of how these biomolecules are built and broken down is always going to be the same. Dehydration synthesis to build them up, hydrolysis to break them down. Okay, so that's going to do it for it admittedly what was a very long video so i appreciate your patience and your attention so join us next time and we will start laying the groundwork for talking about these biomolecules that we just mentioned talking about carbon skeletons functional groups and how to predict a molecule's solubility in water a very important skill that i am going to expect you to develop as the semester goes on so thanks again and i will see you next time